I was a senior at Georgetown University and it was my second semester and I had no idea what I was going to do after graduating. You know, all of my friends were kind of heading off to do these consulting positions in New York City. I didn't even really know what consulting was and I was always kind of too embarrassed to ask. Um, and then another group of my friends were doing law school or business school and I just wasn't particularly, I don't know, motivated or inspired by any of those options. And um, just a real chance encounter. I mean, it's funny what a big, what a big role chance can play. A chance encounter, a young woman was telling me uh, that she's applying to this program called Teach for America. And when I heard her talk about it, I thought, now this would actually be something really, really exciting to do for a couple of years after college. So I applied to Teach for America, I was accepted to Teach for America, and um, I was placed in the Rio Grande Valley. And I remember getting out the map, and I was trying to find the name of the city, Rio Grande Valley. Well, th there's, there's no city called the Rio Grande Valley. In fact, there's not even um, um, uh, a region that's marked in a map, Rio Grande Valley. Uh, but I found McAllen, Texas, uh, which is where the headquarters was for the Teach for America regional office. And um, that's where I was sent. So I graduated Georgetown one day. And then literally the very next day after my last class, I had to take an extra class after graduation to actually fully, truly graduate. So after that extra summer session class I took, um, I, I, I took my exam, I got on the airplane, I went down to McAllen, Texas, and um, that's really when my entire life trajectory changed and I began teaching in this little community of Donna, Texas. And my good fortune is that I got to teach right across the hallway from Joanne Gonzalez, now it's Joanne Gama, and um, she was also a Teach for America core member and just seeing the huge influence that she was making on her students um, really inspired me to want to up my game. And then it just so happened that um, December of our first year of teaching, so this would have been December of 1997, um, Teach for America has, ha had at the time these monthly meetings that were kind of trainings and you had to go and you had to fill out your AmeriCorps paperwork. It was this big bureaucratic tangle. But we'd all show up and it was the only time sometimes we would see people, you know, that month. And um, the gentleman who was speaking to us that night, kind of our evening entertainment, was this guy named Michael Feinberg. And Michael was talking about this little after school program that he had just started called KIPP. Um, and Joanne was listening and I was listening. And when I heard him describe what his students were doing and what their results were, um, I was very skeptical. So Joanne and I decided to, 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 to take a day off teaching and we drove up from the valley to Houston, which is about a six hour drive. If you can believe it, you're driving six hours and you're still well within the state of Texas. <laughs> and we get to Houston and I'll never forget because we showed up to this old office building uh, that had been converted to this makeshift school. And there was something very tangible about walking into that school and thinking, we could do this. You know, they, they, they didn't have lockers. They had, they had milk crates that were turned on their side and they were stacked up. So you had, you know, that was the lockers. The kids had all their books stacked in those milk crates. And then we went into a classroom and we saw these card tables that were sagging in the middle, just these folding tables and chairs sagging in the middle from the weight of the textbooks. And um, the classroom instruction was fantastic. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't so exceptional that it seemed impossible. It was really high quality teaching. So Joanne and I got in the car and the entire drive back down to the Rio Grande Valley, seeing this dilapidated building, seeing the makeshift lockers, seeing kind of the sagging card tables, we thought to ourselves, we could do this. We actually could do something at least this cool in the Rio Grande Valley. So that is really what, 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 what sparked it, um, what, what kind of planted that seed inside our minds that we actually could start a charter school. In the middle of my third year of teaching, so I'd done my two years in Teach for America plus one semester, uh, Joanne had moved back to Houston at this time and she was teaching in Aldean ISD and I was trying to keep idea running as part of the district and it was just clear to me that for a variety of reasons we were never going to be able to thrive if we were under the auspices of the district. So I decided to apply for a charter, uh, which is what KIPP had done and what Yes College Prep had done. And I had visited both of those schools and was deeply impressed and very inspired. So I applied to the state of Texas. We got our application turned in. Um, it was, you know, paper about that thick. And I remember getting it off in the mail. And then a couple of weeks later, um, I got a phone call from the Texas Education Agency. And they said, Tom, you've passed the minimal score, whatever it is that you needed to go to the next level. Um, they said, so now you've got to come um, 
testify before the State Board of Education. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen an episode of C-SPAN. You know, watching C-SPAN is quite dull. Living C-SPAN is frightening. I mean, it's energizing. And talk about your heart pumping. You know, here I was, uh, 24 years old, sitting in my solitary chair behind a microphone, and there's this semicircle of elected officials in front of me, you know, all of whom are 50, 60, mid-60s, white hair. They just look so distinguished and so um, intimidating from their perch. And um, I, 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 I was, you know, just terrified that there was no way I was going to be able to persuade them to give me a chance to launch a school. Well, thankfully for me, uh, before I testified, uh, Chris Barbick, the founder of Yes College Prep, he already had a school up and running. Um, it was getting remarkable results. He really was the, the, the darling of the State Board of Education. I mean, they just loved the guy. You know, he's good looking, he's funny, he's charismatic, his school results were exceptional. Um, and he was talking about a totally unrelated, you know, subject. And at the very, very end of his testimony, he said, you know, you guys are going to hear in a few minutes from this guy named Tom Torkelson, and he's running a program down in South Texas, and they're the next big thing in education. You guys should approve it. And um, just like that, um, all of the problems that they had flagged in our application, and they were significant problems, everybody else who had the challenges that we had got denied. Um, but because Chris Barbic had provided that little bit of advocacy and boosterism, I mean, every question I got was a total softball. I remember um, Grace Shore, the chairwoman of the planning committee who was responsible for us at the State Board of Approving Charters. Um, her, her questions went from being very hard to the people before me to being quite easy. She said, your numbers in your budget don't add up. You're going to fix that, right, sweetie? I was like, yes, ma'am. And sort of everything she pointed out, it was, you're going to take care of that, right? And my answer was, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And that basically was the um, entirety of my testimony, was me saying yes ma'am. And thanks to Chris Barbic, we were unanimously approved the next day by the State Board of Education. The state of Texas approved our charter application in March, so we had April, May, June, July, August. I guess that's five months to recruit students, hire teachers, find a building, buy buses, figure out how we're going to feed 150 students breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack. And by the way, do this with not one penny of funding until a week before the school year began. So, I mean, just looking back at it now, the odds were really stacked against us, um, particularly because our school building wasn't ready. We were going to lease space from the First Baptist Church of Donna in downtown Donna, Texas, and um, the building was not up to code. And the modular building that we were moving across the street uh, wasn't ready either. And it was, it, was, it was a week before school. And I already thought, you know, in the eyes of these parents, I probably don't have too much credibility. Again, 24 years old, only taught for a couple of years, never really been in charge or run anything bigger than my classroom. Um, and I was painfully insecure that these parents were just going to figure out that I was a fraud. And when the building wasn't ready, I was even more convinced that, that, that they were just going to lose faith and lose confidence. Um, but I just remember having this moment of soul searching and thinking, you know, if we're going to make this work, we're going to have to really enlist and engage parents. And I put out an all call to the parents and to the students and let them know what the situation was. And the days before the school was to open, they showed up with their hammers and their nails and their paint brushes and they were installing ceiling fans and putting in exit, exit, emergency exit signs and fixing some of the electrical and code challenges that we were having. And it was amazing to just see how the students and their families literally built the school and the first day of school came and I just remember you know well first of all I overslept it was the first and last time in my entire life that I've ever been late for work in terms of oversleeping just because we were up until four o'clock the night before and it seemed like I just put my head down and all of a sudden it was an hour into the school year and I get to school and everything it was just operating so smoothly the kids were all in class and the teachers were teaching I thought wow this this um there's not much to this charter school thing. It's not going to be too hard after all. And um, well, at the end of the school day, actually, Joanne and I shared an office, and I had my feet, I literally had my feet on top of the desk. And it was one of those things where I had my hands kind of behind my head, and I was like leaning back. I thought, wow, we really nailed it the first day. Well, and then the phone rang. And um, I pick up the phone, and it was one of our bus drivers, Omar. He was telling me that uh, our, our bus had caught on fire. Oh. I thought, oh my goodness, on the first day of school, I'm like, okay, first we had the building, 
That did not inspire confidence. Now we have a bus on fire. These parents are really going to be heading for the hills. Well, Joanne and I jumped in the car and we drove out to the, to the north side of town where the bus was. And as we're getting there, I start seeing these billowing clouds of black smoke. And I'm just thinking, oh, dear God, you know, what, what am I going to see when I get there? And there's the bus driver. No students are around. And I said, Omar, what's, what's going on? Where are the students? And he said, uh, Mrs. Prado came by in her pickup truck, and they all jumped in the back, and she's, she's dropping them off right now. <laughs> I thought, thank God for Mrs. Prado. I'm sure we're breaking a whole bunch of state laws right now, but thank goodness for her, or else we'd have no idea how to get these kids home. <laughs> back in 2005, we were just beginning to think about expanding. We had thousands of students on the waiting list. We still had just our one school in Donna. And about that time, the Gates Foundation reached out to us, and they said that they were getting into education. It's crazy to think now that there was a time when they were not involved in education because they've just been such a key driver in education reform. But they said they were thinking about getting involved in education and they were thinking about investing in promising organizations in Texas and they asked us to submit a proposal. And we submitted the proposal and I forget how much we asked for, maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And um, I got a call back from the person who would become our program officer and she said, you know, Tom, um, we're a large, large foundation. We're not really looking at gifts that are below the seven-figure amount. She said, so why don't we send a team of experts down and help you put your business plan together? Um, well, the great thing was, um, you know, I realized that I had really made a mistake in understanding how to grow and how to get bigger. And part of it was just because I had no... I had no model, I had no kind of mental map to be able to follow. So I reached out to um, you know, Don Shelby at Aspire Public Schools and I reached out to uh, Daisha and Doug um, at Achievement First um, and I reached out to my friends at Yes Prep and Kip and I just began to collect as many of these multi-year you know, plans as I could and there were things like financial projections and organizational charts and um, just it kind of gave me an idea of the sort of things I would have to be able to first put on paper and be able to conceive if we were ever going to be able to grow. So um, that, that level of sharing amongst the charter CMOs it, um, even from the very beginning was, 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 was evident and it was just another example of people in the movement um, being so willing to share and trying to help others you know, do great work in their communities. You know, there's a lot of things that are very unique about running schools in the Rio Grande Valley. Probably the biggest thing is, you know, nobody's heard of the community. Nobody's heard of McAllen or Brownsville, or if they have, unfortunately, it's because it's been the site of, you know, one of the largest drug busts because we have all of the, all of the, um, you know, crossing points from Mexico to the U.S. We're right on the border. Um, or sometimes we'll be uh, the hottest city in America, so we show up on the weather map. Uh, but other than that, people don't often know much about the Rio Grande Valley. And we began growing and opening schools, and you can imagine our ability to attract talent from the coasts or the big, city in the mid the big cities in the Midwest or the most prestigious universities. I and mean, people weren't wanting to move to South Texas out of college or were not wanting to relocate, you know, to start or to, con to continue their career with Idea Public Schools in deep South Texas. So we found from the very beginning that we were going to have to find um, the very best, most capable, smartest, passionate educators who were from the Rio Grande Valley. And we were gonna have to train and coach and mentor um, them so they'd be able to launch these world-class schools that, um, they're not just good schools that are good enough for somebody else's children. You know, my 10-year-old goes to uh, one of our schools. My seven-year-old goes to one of our schools. My four-year-old, when she's old enough, will go to one of our schools as well. Um, so th that has just been incredibly gratifying that we do have within our community um, people with the right mindset and the right talent and the vision for what's possible in public education. When we were recruiting students and parents to come to IDEA, it was a really basic bargain that we made with them. We said, look, you stick with us, we're going to stick with you. And I would tell moms and dads in their living rooms or their homes, I said, I promise I will get your son, I will get your daughter into college. Well, when we made that promise, I mean, it really was just that, a promise. And because our kids were starting with us in middle school, it took all the way until 2007 until we had our first graduating class of high school seniors. It was a small class, about 35 students. And every single one applied to college, and they were all accepted to college, and they all matriculated for the first day of their freshman class first day of the freshman year. And um, that graduating class's uh, college graduation rates are north of 
The class of 08's graduation rates are north of 60%. The challenge now though is we don't just have 30 or 40 students a year graduating. This year we had almost 600 students graduating. So we've seen those numbers slip a bit um, and we went from the 60s to the high 50s to now we're at the low 50s. Um, and we, we began to see this phenomenon when kids were just getting into college when we started having hundreds of students to keep track of. Uh, so we knew right away we had to beef up our alumni support. So we now have an alumni team who's responsible for tracking and supporting and encouraging and coaching our students once they're in college. We knew we had to do an even better job making our high schools more rigorous. So now our kids have to take a minimum of 11 AP exams as part of their high school experience. By the way, one in three of our students are passing at least three AP exams with a three, four, or five, and that's with 100% of our students participating in AP. So, I mean, we saw right away that college access uh, was one thing, but that college success was going to be really the next big challenge for us to tackle. Our college graduation and persistence rates are 52%, um, and we're holding steady, and uh, we're thinking that, you know, our, our goal obviously is to get 75% of our students to and through college. We're about 25 percentage points away from that, but given the national averages of 9% of low-income students earning a four-year degree, um, we feel like our students are showing that it is possible at scale for far more students to graduate college with a baccalaureate degree. This has been a remarkable year for Idea Public Schools. You know, we went from having one school in 2000 to this fall, just a couple of weeks from now, uh, you know, August of 2016, we'll have 50 schools, 30,000 students, we had over 40,000 students apply last year. Um, right now, and I'm a little nervous to say this on camera because this could be a little bit of a historical document, but our plans right now are to get to 100,000 students by 2022. Um, and we've had remarkable help to get there. Uh, we just found out in the last 24 hours that the Charter School Growth Fund is making a $17 million grant investment plus $3 million in loans. Um, Eric and Rainey Harlesom, um, and their daughter Kate from the KLE Foundation have committed $16 million for Austin, um, El Paso, the philanthropic community there, the business community has been quite supportive, uh, same with Baton Rouge.